it's nothing. <laughs> All right, go for it. <laughs> All right, we got it. Great. So before we get started, um, maybe I could ask about the uh, the Gidley paper that we all read. And I don't know if you get a chance to see the, the second installment, TJ. I know I, you wrote. Yeah, no, I got about an hour into it. Okay. Um, I think, yeah, Marco was talking when I had to shut it off. Yeah, I thought that the Gidley paper was really stimulating and I really appreciate that you recommended it to us. And um, I, I can see how I, it goes in many, it could go in many different directions because yeah. there's so much research that she did. And I've learned, you know, about new writers that I want to explore. Um, and I'm, I was also thinking about the work that you did with the human cycle and working oh, with right, Arvindo. Yeah. And um, I, so I feel like we're planting some seeds, you know. Um, what, is that, what, is it, what do you do with a hoe? You, you, you rake the dirt, right? You loosen up the soil and then you plant the seeds. I think so, seed. yeah. I think you yeah. Yeah, make a line in it and then you can put different seeds in there. So that's what yeah, I feel like. That's what we're doing. Yeah. <laughs> Guard, well, that's we're gardening. Like, <laughs> if we're going to use that gardening motor, or I feel like that's the stage I'm at, is I'm like uh, trying to loosen up the soil a little bit so it can, so it can take the seeds. So who knows what might uh, be uh, harvested later. Um, but I also wanted to um, uh, work on reading at your best. And do a little in clean interview, and you're familiar with this technique. We've done it, I've done it with both of you before. Um, and then we could, you know, show, show pictures, have a little map, and then we could discuss that. And then we could, um, I imagine, come up with all, all kinds of things to explore after that. Um, I, and I'm very interested in, I don't know, do you know Jeffrey Kripal? I've quoted from him many times. I... I think you put a video, he did a video lecture. I think you put one on what, I forget what the, um, what the thread topic was, but he showed up in one and he was talking about a woman who had, uh, I forget what the experience was. Um, um, I, she I, don't, got I, I don't know if it was past, like, yeah, she had gotten struck by lightning or no, that what? Was, she was yeah, struck by okay. lightning. Yeah. And she had like an, uh, an out of body experience. And, right, right. And went to another place and she said she's uh, going to be the topic of a book that he's going to be, I think, coming out soon. Um, but he writes a lot about the paranormal. Um, but what interests me about him is, and he's a philosopher and, well, he's a, a professor of religion, but he looks a lot at paranormal, and, um, which is pretty rare for most religious people, you know, in, in academia. They don't go into the paranormal. <laughs> or <laughs> <Just>, philosophers. <laughs> yeah. So anyway, I just wanted to quote him and okay. uh, because I think it's significant what he was saying. Um, and I, I, I also, I think what's powerful about reading and how, you know, reading is a transmission. Uh, and he's sort of, uh, he thinks it's telepathic. The people who've, who've died, but they've written something, we read it, we're reactivating, sort of tapping into a field, if you want to use that metaphor. And uh, he takes that, uh, I think, to a really interesting place. So he was um, in India, in Bengali, and he was studying a, a tantric master, uh, Ramakrishna. And, um, and then he had, a, and he, so he was immersing himself in this uh, area of study. And then he talks about this experience that he had. One morning, I woke up asleep. That is, I woke up, but my body did not. I couldn't move. I was paralyzed like a corpse, more or less exactly like the Hindu god Shiva, as he's traditionally portrayed in tantric art, lying prostrate beneath Kali's feet. Then those feet touched me, an incredibly subtle, immensely pleasurable, and terrifyingly powerful energy entered me, possessed me, completely overwhelmed me. My vibrating body felt as if I had stuck a fork in a wall socket all sexual innuendos intended. And wall sockets in India, by the way, put out far more voltage than American ones. <laughs> Perhaps more significantly, my brain felt as if it had suddenly hooked up to some sort of occult internet and that billions of bits of information were being downloaded into its neural net. Or better, it felt as if my entire being was being reprogrammed or rewired. A door in the night, a portal had opened. 
And this was all before I felt my soul or subtle body, for it still had a shape, being pulled out of my physical body by some sort of invisible super magnet. Electromagnetic would work extremely well as a descriptor, as long as one understands that this energy was both obviously conscious and super intelligent. And somehow completely other or well alien. In terms of the alien abduction literature, which is we will see soon enough, bears an unusually intimate connection to the popular cultural materials, which in some sense is the experiential core behind the sci-fi and superhero folklore. Abductees commonly speak of the cellular change that they have undergone. Before they are beamed through a wall or ceiling, Star Trek style, it is as if an intense energy is separating every cell or even every molecule of their bodies. After such experiences, moreover, they feel that powerful residual energies are left in their bodies as if stored in the cells themselves. That is exactly how it felt and still feels in my memory. It is almost as if some kind of direct right-brained mind-to-mind -mind transmission took place, as if those residual plasmic energies were encoded with ideas or structures that could not be languaged, but could be stored and later intuited and consciously shaped in the mirror of other resonant or echoing authors until they could appear, now through the prism of the left brain's words as my books. <clears throat> so he's, he's basically inviting the reader to, uh, to tap into these energies um, as they read his, his research. So I think this is very creative research. And I, you know, I sort of hold that out as sort of like an ideal um, as we start uh, reading these, uh, you know, pretty esoteric kind of, kind of reading. And um, I thought this is a contemporary author. He's very much alive and with us. But Aurobindo, um, he died, I guess, in the 50s. 1950. Yeah. And so he was, and he was writing about the same, the, the Hindu tantric tradition. But he was also, came out of the Victorian era. So I was wondering... Um, about this, this seems, I, when I tried to read Aurobindo before, I always felt like there was something there that I intuited, but that it wasn't being put forward in language. I felt it was veiled somehow. <clears throat> and um, I felt that way about most tantric stuff. It was pretty impenetrable to me. Uh, but it had a lot of these experiences, like the ones he's described, and you guys may have as well. I mean, it's not I think that it's maybe not that rare, actually. I just think it's rarely reported because, um, it, you know, it's especially in our culture, which is so sex phobic and how, you know, the sacred and sex are, are, are very, um, uh, a lot of tension around those issues. Sacred so anyway. Profane, yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. The sacred and the profane. So that's sort of my, my spiel, um, where I'm coming from with this. You reminded me, you reminded me of something. Amalia Nanadesikin, I mean, I don't even get the name. <laughs> she starts her book, it's a history, basically it's a history of writing, but she starts wow. it, she starts it with, uh, it's really good, it's not that long, but it's just kind of a, um, the technology and the kind of cultural that goes behind different, different kinds of writing sets. I think she even does some Sequoia, the Cherokee. Uh, language and it's really good but she starts the book this way and what you had said before about the telepathy between reading had reminded me of it uh, this sentence is a time machine I wrote it a long time before you opened this book and read it yet here are my words after all this time pristinely preserved as good as new the marvelous technology that allows the past to speak directly to the future in this way is by now so pervasive that we take it for granted it is writing Wow. So, you know. <laughs> Very cool. That's called The Writing Revolution. The Writing Revolution by Amalia. <laughs> G N G N A N D E S I K A N. <laughs> wow. Nana Desikin, I believe. <laughs> wow. You might have to post that one for me. I pr yeah, I'm going to take a list of articles that are coming up to me as I. Uh, <laughs> as we yeah. Go. Cool. How you doing, Doug? I'm all right. I'm I'm <laughs> baffled by the quotes already. They're they're taking me into another realm. But uh, it, it's reminded me of um, which I don't have in front of me or a book to hold up as usual. But um, Aaron Manning's uh, "The Minor Gesture," just the 
preface there or the very introductory statement, whatever the title might be, but that, that kind of sucked me into the, the thinking of the minor over the major, which I don't even know exactly what she's getting into other than I can assume by the, the list of chapters, but yeah. Um, yeah, yeah, I'm looking forward to that reading too. Um, so, and I was struggling today with um, the seventh, the chapter seven from the Schlatter Dyke, and I was wondering, you know, what's my what's my strategy here? You know, what's my reading strategy? So I'm going to save I, my comments for tomorrow. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm going to. I'm, I'm so done. I'm <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Just uh, too long. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but I was fascinated because I found myself after reading the Gidley. Um, and how she's tracing out the, uh, the, these lineages and these uh, bifurcation points, like in, um, uh, you see the, the, the German idealists and you see uh, there was uh, the deconstruction and that path and then the, the reconstruction path mm -hmm. and how both of these paths have generated different kinds of discourses. And um, I think he, and I, I may be wrong, but I get the feeling he's definitely in that still in that deconstructive kind of path. He's pulling things apart. I'm not getting- about slaughtered IQ. Yeah, I'm not getting re a reconstruction happening. He just seems, I was waiting for that. It's fine, take it apart all you want, as long as you put something back together. <laughs> and, and one video I watched, he, he was describing the whole project as just, basically it's, it's a dead thing there, this, this either, God or religion or this or the whole shebang. He's basically saying, well, I'm examining it from the outer edges here and I'm just uh, laying it out for you. Like, this is, this is how I see it. So he is in a deconstructive kind of so mode. He's at least in spheres, he's not, yet, he's not even necessarily deconstructing. He's just, that this is what it is and <laughs> throwing out anything he can. I'm not even I, getting a bricolage here, though. <laughs> yeah. mm -hmm. I'm not even, you know, it's it's bubbles was the these discourses and in literature. Well, I'll save it for tomorrow. <laughs> okay, well, I, but, it's yeah, my, yeah I mean, it's my fault for for bringing him up, but no, no, no. <laughs> I think there is a uh, yeah. I'll save my comments for tomorrow too, and I haven't finished that chapter, but I think mm -hmm. that it helped reading the Gidley. So mm -hmm. if I get stuck with an author and I'm I can go to another author and I can get some inspiration and then I can go back to the author that I was stuck with. And now that I feel like I have a, a category for where he is, I'm not expecting from him something that he's not going to deliver. So if I, okay, he's just, he's in this deconstruction kind of mode. And if that's the case. And along with Nietzsche and Deleuze and, you know, all these other Derrida, they were all, deconstructors and I think that's a fine noble tradition that you know I need to get more comfortable with so um, but I think your reconstructive point at the end of it is very important just yeah. my opinion on it but yeah 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 and I think this is what I learned from from reading Gidley because I think she really demonstrates um, yeah. the the reconstruction and the deconstruction and how Hampson those, was good with that too. Yeah, Hampson, Yeah, I read Hampson as well. So, um, so let me ask you guys: Are you ready to uh, to relax and go into Let's this? Do it. Okay. Um, I wanted to. Um, does anyone have a preference for who goes first? I would prefer not to. <laughs> <laughs> Rock paper scissors. <laughs> I'll go first. <laughs> okay, great. Um, so when you're writing, when you're reading at your best, that's like what? When I'm reading at my best, and I did actually think a little bit about this today in preparation, or sort of preparation, um, there's, there are three elements to it. And they are absorption, retention, and connection. And to start with the last first connection is a lot like what you were just describing a couple of minutes ago. There is an author and I'm not quite getting the point, but I remember somebody read this and I'm kind of able to make those, it just kind of jumps into my head 
very quickly if I'm reading at my best. And it kind of jumps into your head. And when it kind of jumps into your head, is there anything else about jumps into your head? It jumps into my head and it connects me with a point. It connects me with a piece of information. It connects me with something helpful or even just a, a morsel of something for thought. And it jumps into your, into your head and connects to a point, mm -hmm. to a morsel. Right. And when it connects, whereabouts connects when jumps into your head? I guess there's a connection between the words that are going in front of my eyes and the memory or a passage. It's just a kind of a space bubble. A space bubble. Yeah. And when a space bubble, whereabouts is that space bubble? Does space bubble have a size or a shape? Space bubble looks like my map of time from before. <laughs> oh, okay. So it swirls around in that space. And wind swirls around in your space. What happens next? I understand things. I make connections. I'm able to have what I've read um, connect to something else. I, I learn something new or I reinforce something that I suspected or it totally challenges what I had suspected. But yeah, I, I, I absorb something that that's helpful that I'm and, able to put together. It's like putting together a puzzle almost. And it's like putting together a puzzle and connections and a space bubble swirls <laughs> and words and eyes and memory and lots of exciting stuff when i read <laughs> and lots at, of my exciting, at, <laughs> at my best at your best at my best and it jumps into my head and connects me and when it jumps into my head is there anything else about it when it jumps into my head It can be a lot of things. Um, again, at my best, all of them good. All of them, you know, coalescing around, around an idea or a thought. It can be a lot of things. Yeah, so it can take a lot of shapes. It can, you know, go in a lot of directions. And when it, and shapes, what kind of shapes? In the radiating circles. Ah. Inward and outward, again, going back to the, the bubble space in a way. Radiant. Sometimes, but sometimes it's a line. Sometimes it's a straight mental line. So, you know. It's... And radiating circles and inside and outside. Mm -hmm. Did I? Okay. And mental lines. Yeah, some, again, multi directional. And, and multi-directional. And with all of that, what happens to retention? The useful pieces of information, the useful swirls, the useful lines, the useful somehow, and I don't know if I can exactly explain how, but Again, the, the absorption, the connection, and the retention are all connect, <laughs> connected, for lack of a better word. And, and yeah. I, I, I come away from the book or the article or whatever with a sense of having added to what's going on, but having added to it in a way that helps make sense of it and opens up further avenues at the same time. Great. Can we pause? We can pause. Because <laughs> I don't know how I'm going to draw a picture of all that, but I'll try. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> just, 
That's just something that makes sense to you. Okay. okay. <laughs> and while you're doing while you're doing that, I work with Doug. Great. Thank you. <laughs> Doug. And when you're reading at your best, that's like what? So I, I'm thinking of the, I think a comment you made just on the Soul Mountain reading where we had, you had admitted and I'm, I completely agreed with what you said that you just can't read fiction anymore and it's all focused on nonfiction or articles or papers. And um, I think Marco made the comment which is something I've said to myself before that I can't really dive into that fiction piece that I wish to read because I, I want to gather up more information before I jump into some sort of masterpiece. Um, so for me, when I'm reading at my best, I'm, there's, there is this total, I think TJ just used the word absorption. So it is, it, it's similar to flow, that, that idea of flow. So when reading, I'm, not necessarily tuned out. I, I need a certain space, typically alone, typically um, set it up in some fashion with maybe a little bit of coffee beforehand or uh, a centering. Um, of course, that isn't always going to happen with every reading, but at my best, that there will be this, this focus, this absorption into and the material. And this focus, and you made a gesture right around your head, and this focus, and coffee, and centering, and alone, and flow, and total absorption, and flow, and when flow, whereabouts flow? I was trying to avoid my, my previous maps, but it, it's going right back to it. It's, it's kind of funny, but it is, it is this vision in front of me, not necessarily the actual book I'm reading or uh, computer screen maybe, but it's once I have that information coming in, there is this broadening. Now I'm, I'm almost wanting to jump into Ghibli of, of weaving my tapestry and <laughs> doing all that sorts of strange elder work and vision in front of you and information coming in and vision in front and when vision in front is there anything else about that vision in front when reading at your best there are messages coming in from all directions, I suppose. Um, so, yeah, again, there's the past memories kind of coming up into that, that front tapestry area in which it, yeah, uh, the only metaphor I can think of is, yeah, there's this constant weaving and reweaving and um, maybe an operator kind of taking the the old time operator taking the various knobs and switching and except instead of connecting to a different person it's it's my own mental model connecting various points and they're most if it's at my best it's going to be connecting in such a way that is hopefully going to be wired in my memory so i can easily recall and wired in your memory and an old time operator. And is there anything else about that operator? When an old time operator? That it's, uh, it's slow going. Um, it's not necessarily switching very quickly, though ah. that is possible. But at and my best, it would be a slower process. And it's slow going and an old time operator and the past memory. Is there anything else about that past memory? Yeah, 
yes, it, it needs to be connected in some form. Simply, uh, be, I, I notice when I'm reading in general, I'm going to recall the previous individual I just read and say, oh, well, that sounds just like this. But if I'm really focused, I can maybe go back even further, maybe 20 years ago and say, oh, so this is how this connects to this. And, um, but it, it will be, the past memories will be, yeah, they'll be infused, I suppose. And the past memories will be infused? Did I hear you right? Yes, that's what I said. And then what happens? Oh, well, let me ask, is there a relationship between past memory needs to be connected and old time operator slow going? So as we've noticed with our slow language, our slow processing, our slow time thought processes, we, we've, for me, that's going to be like actually examining the past with the present. So it can, something can change. Um, it's, it's too easy to have an operator that's very quick um, but to actually find someone who knows how to make the right connections is. And, and examining past and present. Correct. And then what happens to flow? It's, it's a, a smooth, steady flow. No interruptions. Smooth, steady, no interruptions. Is that a good place to pause? Sounds right. Thank you. So if you do a, a sketch or a map that makes sense to you, I can go back to TJ. Can you show us your, your, your drawing? No. Uh, the light's not good. Oh, okay. Okay. Is that making? A little bit further back. About... Yeah, can you okay. Still make it out? Okay. Yeah, I can see the whole thing now. Okay. So I have my bubble space. I have the book I happen to be reading at the time on top with a large arrow going into the bubble space. And as you see in the bubble space, I, like I said, I'm not completely in control of this process, but I know connections are being made uh, within the bubble space or all the books that have been read, hence the writing on the pages, all the ideas that are being sparked and then the arrow leading out of the bubble space into all these books with no lettering on them are the books that I know that I have yet to read. Okay. But and the, the, the absorption is good. The retention of all these ideas is good. And the connections being made is kind of how I'm trying to illustrate that. And, and the as you notice the, oh, go ahead. No, no, go ahead. Sorry. Yeah. And you notice the books look kind of like the uh, old kids, how they draw birds, right? Oh, yeah. <laughs> it's all yeah. The flying around. That's, yeah, it's all. Uh, and the like birds so. are flying around, or the books are flying around. The books are flying around, yeah. <laughs> like birds. And, and there's the bubble space, mm -hmm. and the ideas, the and the bulbs. sparks, and the arrow, and the book, the book, that's the book that you're reading currently. Right, the big one is the one that's being read currently. And the, that happens to be. And the books outside of the bubble. Is there anything else about those books? Are those these the ones that are like birds? They're all like birds, but these are the ones that have to be kind of netted and brought into the bubble space. I haven't read them yet. <laughs> oh, I see. So there's a two, there's an arrow going into the bubble and there's right. an arrow going out of the bubble. Because some of these ideas and sparks are right. Oh, and there's an author that I really need to pick up, or there's an article that I've been at. So those are the things that have to have yet to be captured. Okay. In the space. So what are you most drawn to? 
I'm most intimidated by the number of books that are on the outside compared to the ones that are in. <laughs> okay. Thank you. And maybe when you when we finish, you, you guys could post these. Yeah, I'll I try to. could scan them and post yeah. them. That would be cool. Um, let me ask you, what environment supports you when reading at your best? Quiet. Quiet. <laughs> and as a husband and father, I noticed the absence of quiet. <laughs> I used to read a lot faster years ago. Now, good trade-off, I have to say, but you know, I definitely, if I can get that day when there's nothing going on, I don't have to go anywhere and I can hit the library for a morning, that's when I can sit and focus. And what environment prevents you from reading at your best? Oh, just a lot of other stuff going on. <laughs> and what kind of behaviors or activities allow you to read at your best? in those when when there's a lot of stuff going on when you're at your best oh, when i'm at my best no yeah just, what what behaviors or activities are you uh, just a value? just a, a space an organized space um you know notebooks over here the book i have in front other things that i might be referencing you know just kind of in the, within arm's reach and a preparation for absorption. Preparation for absorption. And books arranged, you said, in your space? Yeah, yeah. Kind of like if I'm going to have a pile or something like that, I'll have, but it'll, it'll be a, to a side or something, and I can, I don't know which ones I'm looking for. And what skills or abilities allow you to read at your best? A certain amount of openness to what I'm reading, whether or not I agree with it uh, right away, um, a willingness to let an author convince me or, or at least, you know, state, state a case or present something. And I'm using, I notice I'm using a lot of mental structure terms, but I think that's correct for this, or at least for me. Um, it, it is a it is a mental structure exercise, and it is a kind of information arranging and gathering. And openness and willingness and a mental structure. Yeah, yeah. It's not a, it's not a magical thing. It's not a mythical. <laughs> At and least when it's nonfiction, which is which is the majority of the stuff I read. And what is important? when reading at your best? Good question. It's, 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 a, it's a coming away, like I was alluding to before, it's a coming away with either a greater knowledge or a, a greater comprehension of the extent of my ignorance or you know, something that moves me. You know, I put effort into the book and I've gotten something out of it. And I think that's... And you put something into the book and you got something out of it and something moves you and coming away with greater knowledge. Yeah. And when coming away with greater knowledge and something moves you, who are you when reading at your best? I'm that kid TJ that we talked about in one of the other threads who's gotten to sit at someone's feet and, and hear a story, hear, hear wisdom from a life that I might never lead or might not have any other contact with, but just to be able to, you know, get that. And then it's and something that, I can take back into my world and space and, oh, it's an expanded perspective on, on something. And that kid TJ. <laughs> And how old is that kid, TJ? That, that kid, TJ, is every age from nine to 50. <laughs> <laughs> and when that kid, TJ, anywhere from nine to 50, is there anything else about mental structure? When kid, TJ. 
Good one, good one. Because TJ the child wasn't quite there yet. But <laughs> good, one. good one. Yeah, okay. I guess there's still a little bit of magic in there. <laughs> a little, a little bit of magic. <laughs> Just a little bit. The point in the center. <laughs> A little bit of magic, a point a in the center. Yeah, that little bit of a, a point. Um, yeah, I mean, the again, nonfiction, again, absorbing information and building perspective is a kind of mental structure thing. But I guess I do it all for a more magical reason than don't I? <laughs> <laughs> for that more magical reason. And when Kid TJ and that magical... And when all of that and the mental structure, what is your relationship to others? When reading at your best? More patient. Uh, more will, you know, and I, and I hate that willing to listen is like, oh, you know, tolerance, like from a high and mighty position, I tolerate. Just more, more ability to step in and empathize. And, and oh. truly, truly listen. You know, I think that's a, that's you know what I mean. It's a cut above tolerance. <laughs> it's, yeah. You know, it, it's a reaching in, and you know, reaching in. Yeah. And more than tolerance. Yeah. Yeah. Is that a good place to pause? Sounds good to me. <laughs> is, there, is there anything else? Um. No. Nah, let's see what else comes out of. <laughs> Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do the same thing with you, Doug. If, do you show us your picture first, though? I, I kind of got sidetracked. I, that, that was a good session there. With the, But um, let's see. The central got it. area here is maybe the headspace. Uh -huh. It disappears because of the point of view. It's going to, so this is the past thoughts and memories coming in. As mentioned, the tapestry kind of goes around the entire wow. space, but the focus mm -hmm. tends to be the visual, what I see, especially when reading. Uh, so there's the current book or the current reading. Uh -huh. And then my operator is here on the tapestry, uh -huh. um, sitting in a chair, relaxing. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. doing doing the switching um these could be past books like uh, maybe tj had or just points i think you mentioned too mm -hmm. um so I, that's how i visualize it there they're they're on the tapestry and, and instead of maybe putting in whatever that connector would be in the old days there would be maybe a thread and a needle so kind of weaving in there mm -hmm. uh, so it's a pretty simple drawing. Maybe I'll add more a little bit later there. Cool. Sorry. Cool. And what are you most drawn to? Just the fact that the tapestry showed up once again. Ah, that was okay. unexpected. I, I came here unprepared um, without any image in my mind. So for that to reappear is pretty interesting. Yeah. Okay. Is that a good time to pause? It's fine with me. Okay. Um, so what is the environment? You already spoke about this a little bit, but what is the environment that supports you reading at your best? And yeah, I did note, mention the, the physical space, but there is, there is the head space. Um, like just a minute ago when TJ was talking, I was transported to when I last got an oil change and I was sitting in the waiting room and I happened to be the only one there so I was able to really get focused and I was pacing back and forth holding a book and so I, I need to move often when I talk on the phone or reading a book to kind of get in that flow if I'm standing still then I, I don't know I, I kind of become too self-conscious of what's going on so the movement is also necessary for me so hmm. the movement is necessary for you to read at your best. And are there any other behaviors or activities that allow you to read at your best? The, uh, 
yeah, the pacing, uh, being alone, I'm able to do, do things that uh, I would normally not do when others are around if I'm reading. So I might, I don't, I don't know, get excited and run or something. I don't know. <laughs> pacing and feeling alone. So just and getting involved with the reading. And getting involved in the reading. And what skills or, acti or abilities allow you to read at your best? Definitely an education of the language of the or the level. I, I tend to be, not that having a bachelor's degree is all that bad, but to, to tap into some of these authors that we're reading now, there, there is an under, needs to be an understanding of the language being used. And that, that's where Kid Doug might step in and say, well, I, <laughs> this isn't even in the dictionary here, so I don't know <laughs> what to do. <laughs> and Kid Doug steps in. And when Kid Doug steps in, what's important? So I, I've mentioned on the forum that I, I really enjoy listening and watching you all in action just so I can pick up 10 new authors within five minutes or whatever it might be. <laughs> um, but to, could you repeat it again? Yeah. When kid Doug enjoys listening, is there anything else? It's important to you. So if we were to transpose this into reading, yeah, it, it's the same process. Uh, yeah. I think TJ may have just said it, the same idea there of being guided along, kind of listening to a story, um, just just getting sucked into the, the reading. And guided along and listening to story and enjoy listening and transpose. And when enjoy listening and guided along, who are you when reading at your best? Mm -hmm. I'm a, a kid that uh, doesn't have to fidget any longer. I'm able to just be focused on the words, be focused on the material. And, and I'm not too concerned of moving around and being distracted, I suppose. And not fidgeting around and focused on the material. And when focused, what is your relationship to others? It's going to be a connection, but when reading, it's, it's tends to be an individual thing. So my relationship to others will be the same of extracting past memories of maybe a friend who said this or something like that. But if I'm in a crowd, then I may, if the reading's engrossing enough, I'll, I'll want to participate or share the information. Okay, great. Thank you. Thank you both. Um, that was really challenging for me. Um, I'm really trying to um, um, create these kinds of collaborative research projects that we're working on. And I'm, you know, working on a, like a one-on-one -on -one with people. I found uh, useful, but a great, uh, it's limiting in a way. So I think when working with a group and you, you, you're different, um, but I th there's something that spills over, I think, when you're listening to another person's process or watching someone else process, even though we're using the same language, um, there's a, a difference uh, that I think makes a difference. So it's my expectation that that enriches our, uh, our own maps. Other people's maps can enliven or enlarge my own map. And, you know, we're all map makers and we're all continuing to make maps. So I was wondering if there was any sort of um, stimulation you got or anything that you learned from the other person's map making process? 
I know I, I intentionally resonance or whatever. You know, I'm I'm look, I'm searching for words here, but I I intentionally did not listen to TJ, other than the first three words that he said about maybe absorption, retention, and connection, or I, I can't remember the three words, but clearly I I still soaked in quite a bit what he said because it was almost identical to the the process, or maybe reading in general is the same process, and we all use similar or related terms. No, I think there is definitely a lot of unconscious or subconscious processing going on there. Yeah, I think we feed off of each other just in the just in the exercise itself. I mean, and <laughs> uh, Doug's switchboard operations probably would make sense of these bubbles and ideas and connections that I've got going on. <laughs> That's cool. Yeah. I was thinking about this when I was uh, thinking about this process because I was um. <laughs> Many years ago, I think I was in my maybe mid-20s, I was reading a novel. It was a, real, a classic by Stendhal. Um, the Charter the House name. Of, yeah, it's the, the Charter name. House of Parma. This is in my okay. fiction phase. I was reading tons <laughs> of it. But I was, on, I was in rush hour traffic. I had a strap, you know. There I was reading my paperback <laughs> book. <laughs> and I was at this climactic stage in this, in this part of the novel. And I literally, I shouted, oh my God, and the whole thing, everyone looked around, what? I was like, I can't believe it, I can't believe it. It was that kind of kinesthetic, bam. Uh, and, I and it would thrilled me. Uh, and then many years later, I guess maybe 10 years later, I was reading a writer. She was a very accomplished novelist herself and she was talking about the reading experience. And she said one day she was reading the Charter House of Parma by Stendhal, and she had a moment of total uh, euphoria when, she, when the parts in the novel started to come together, and she screamed, oh my God, and she <laughs> ran around the block <laughs> <laughs> before she returned back to her, uh, to her, her couch and, and finished it. And so I we thought, know wow. Stendhal has a gift. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm not the only one. <laughs> you know, but it, but, it, but it gave me that feeling of, um, you know, like this invisible community of readers, you know, and overlaps. Um, and there must be something different and something similar that, you know, these classics, you know, have a power to them because simply so many people have read them over and over again. So they accumulate, uh, they're like attractors in our culture. Um, and I think that it's true in every field, in poetry or, or, or nonfiction or history, or certainly philosophy. <clears throat> you can just feel when you're reading philosophy, how many people have read Plato? <laughs> you know? How many people have, have suffered with Schlotterdijk? <laughs> and feel the Not presence. many. <laughs> yeah. I, I, and, or, or, with the, or when you're reading someone who's really clear, like Gidley, or I find, I find Aurobindo, even though he's extremely sort of esoteric. But he's direct. Uh, he, yeah, I know where he's coming from. Yeah. You know, these are well-constructed, thought-out sentences. And every sentence flows into a paragraph and the paragraph flows into a chapter. Um, other things of his I've read, I've not read Life Divine or, or the one that you, you studied, but I've read other things by him. And, yeah, that was uh, my only concern was the, at least with the proposed reading list you guys might have read that it was a little top heavy and I I think the only issue with Aurobindo is kind of getting into his his rhythm because he does have a page long paragraph before um, <laughs> yeah jumping to the next idea and yeah I call that Thomas Jefferson writing style <laughs> yeah so, yeah yeah you know. I, well I'm just interested because I think both of you guys and I think that our whole group um are comparativists. It just seems to be our natural, what we like to do is, is contrast and compare. And I think we're doing a comparative philosophy, really. Um, and I think our, the fiction, I think, has a, a slightly different sort of uh, feel to it. Um, but I think, um, I was curious because TJ, you were reading uh, I, I, I tried to find it on uh, your, a quote, so I could quote you back, but I couldn't find it. But I remember you were reading um, several things. I think it was Human Cycle, and you were reading Ingold, and you were reading um, 
maybe it was Slaughter Dyke and it was somebody else and you just, and you, and you said you had an epiphany. You remember writing that? <laughs> oh, that yeah, was a while ago. Yeah. yeah. Actually, while ago. actually accidentally printed that out for some reason. Um, ah! <laughs> do, you have, do you have it there? I couldn't find it. Uh, it'll take me a minute, but yeah, keep talking. Yeah. Right. If you if you find the quote, I'd love to you quote it. But I'm just really curious about. Um, I, I get the feeling you're talking about a mental structure, and that it's um that reading is uh, cognitive, that mental structure, in that. Uh, but there was an element of of the magical and the the TJ uh, kids, in. and uh, so it's um, so I'm just very curious about. Um, that uh, that epiphany, um, and how often do you have these epiphanies? I brought more visual aids. <laughs> <laughs> now I don't know if you can read. How far? I can read. Oh yeah, I can read. Archaic, magical, mythical, mental, vital, emotional. This is our abendo. Right. I put the it's on the top. So this is a chart, and over there it's Merlin Donald. Yes. You were yeah, reading the other one you mentioned there. Yeah. yeah. So, so this is I. These they're are not exactly matched up, of course, because each of these authors is describing slightly different things. Um, but all of them, why I was drawn to all three authors, these are not. Um, they're all interconnected. You don't lose one as you move on to, you don't really move on to the next stage, of course, in, in Gebser, but you, you end up with integral, but after you've a, accumulated all the rest. Uh, Merlin Donald, he calls them stages of mind, but he's also very keen to point out that you, you still have access to all of these when you go to the next stage. Right. And Aurobindo's levels of awareness, you, you know, you, you have levels, they're all here at all times, but one is predominant, and, you know, as you move forward in, in historical time, you have this kind of uh, thing going on. And what struck me in the epiphany was how you could tie it together with more visual aids. <laughs> wow. wow. That is gorgeous. That's amazing. Is there anything else about that? So you, you have, this, this is TJ's not at all pretentious theory of culture, because it's not TJ, it's not TJ's theory, it's, it's you know, an encapsulation. Um, this is what I've been, I think I mentioned it in the uh, email too. So this is, this starts off with Gebser's structures, but Gebser uses the triangle for his mental structure which I think is his, his point about rationality was made, but I, I'm going for a more dimensional expansion with, with this. So yeah, here's your magical point. Here's your mythical circle. I think your mental structure is the, is the sphere. It adds another dimension to the circle, turns it from flat to round. And it starts off with perspectival, but I think Right now, culturally, we're still working on a multi-perspectival understanding of things. I don't think it's a perspectival yet, but I think we kind of have to put all this, all these multi-directional things in the sphere first, and then you get this kind of cloudy torus, which incorporates and, in, and comprehends the whole there. <laughs> the, the cloudy torus? Drowning, drowning in these thought lines. <laughs> and, and, the, and the cloudy Taurus. Yeah. And the Taurus? Yeah, is there anything else about that well, cloudy Taurus? Because the Taurus comprehends it all, but it kind of emanates from it and flows back into its, its center. You know, it's a kind of self-sustaining thing. So I called the Taurus culture but it's not culture like, you know, we fight these culture wars, you know, these days because culture is, you know, this is my set of values versus your set of values because we're not thinking of culture in terms of the whole process, historical time, as well as different spaces in which things happen. And you get, you know, the whole process, once you've integrated the entire process, then you can start really speak of culture on that planetary level that, that Gidley was talking about. 
I've borrowed Gebser's point and I've called it experience, which is because it's life as you live it. And Gebser would call the magical point pre-perspectival because you don't really have a perspective on it. You're in the middle of it going through it. I call the, you know, what would be Gebser's mythical circle, the narrative, which explores and tries to explain. Uh, this is simplified, of course, as millions of points of experience within this mythical circle. And then this mythical circle is one of many mythical circles around different points of experience. And it kind of expands out until you get the sphere. History, which is the sphere. History locates the narratives and the experiences within the narratives. And history puts a chronological framework on that. So you go from life's experiences to the myths that we use to explain the frameworks that we put around the experiences, which are not really oriented. Gebs are called them non-perspectival. They're just kind of frameworks. But then the perspectival comes in with the uh, chronological framework, the putting the, putting the narratives in space time and locating them. But, you know, the grand narrative of, again, one set of values versus another, you have to kind of put in all the rest and get an entire picture of the sphere. And then that's when you start to understand culture. Don't have a handle on, that's why it's so cloudy, don't really have a handle on what the A perspectival is. But I know that as a whole, the culture is comprehending the whole ball of wax. Wow. It's just trying to sort out, like I said on the email, all that stuff that's been floating around. That's kind of where it, where it came out. And with all of that, <laughs> what do you, and you did Ingold, Merlin Donald, Gebser, um, what was the other guy? Orbindo. Orbindo. But I didn't really, yeah, I didn't really, he's just kind of there for a more, more counterpoint because his, as you know, his levels are all present. Actually, it's all ever present, but you know, he's, he's, as you go to the spiritual, you're taking with you the vital, the emotional, the rational, and you're you know, putting it together and integrating it. So it's kind of the same understanding. Um, Engel's mesh work is there because everything is in motion. It's a, it's a world line in space and time. It's not just a fixed thing. And everything is in motion with Engel. Yeah. Get and with all, <laughs> and with Gebser, and with all of that, and epiphanies, and what happens to epiphany with all of that? Is there that a relationship kind of, between all that, that was, and epiphany? That was it. It was kind of like if I was to tie this all together in a way that everything is mutually reinforcing, what would it look like? And that's what that's what came out. <laughs> and the apperspectival. And with all of that, and the apperspectival, what needs to happen for apperspectival? That is the million dollar question. <laughs> that is the million dollar question. Um, and again, just going back to the readings we've done and just where I'm, I'm there, where I'm at with that. Um, I don't know what that looks like. I'm sure multi-perspectival and meta-perspectival kind of set some of the stage for us to, to get there, but I'm really not sure what that looks like. I'm not sure. Um, I know I got to the part in the um, Gidley discussion from yesterday where you guys were talking about uh, how does it go from the individual to the collective? And that was a really good question. I mean, I'm going to have to look at the rest of the video too, but that's kind of, how does it? How does it? How, how do we truly get an integral structure of consciousness that informs the culture, that informs the art, that informs the politics, informs the economics, like we've seen happen in history with the magical, mythical, and mental, but, you know, we haven't really seen it yet. Seen Gebster's pointed out things that can kind of, you know, lead us down that road, but what does that really look like when it's functioning? And that's a great question. Fine. And that, that's kind of what, or another author you explored is Arthur Young and the Reflexive Universe, and that if, which I didn't read, but Marco explained to me in my personal question of why we can't 
like what would the ultimate human species potential or something. Right. Um, yeah. But he mentioned at one point as a counterpoint was Arthur Young's kind of that point before you can take that leap is is the the individual must reach its own perfection or I don't know Young's terms there, but um, yeah, we're, we're it seems like everything is approaching that point or the, the, the next point to get into the collective. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, we hope, I suppose. Yeah, um, I, I, I think the, um, this is great. I just want to open this up to uh, a, a little bit more. Well, it's a little after nine o'clock, so we have a few more minutes if you want to um, yeah. tie this up. Because I think the, um, what I was, the apperspectival is artful with a capital A, my Finn Bonnie. Bonita Roy made that statement and I quoted her um, because I think it's, it's, we, we prize the cognitive and all these maps and we have many, many maps. I think there's also something that that somatic self, um, that little bit of magic that's still there, um, I think that's going to be uh, a partner. I think for me, as I'm just sharing this with you, because I don't, I don't know what the app perspective will, looks like either. Um, but I, you're right. I think it's going to be certainly more art than science. Yeah, I think so. I think art, uh, I think science has dominated us. Um, and I think that vision logic, that, uh, you know, what kind of vision, what kind of logic, and maybe multiple logics are going to be required rather than that frozen binary which we've all we all know and love <laughs> <laughs> either or well, yeah it's either true or it's false and i thought that was what i enjoyed about our conversation with lisa because she was bringing in uh, uh multiple multiple logics uh, four valued logics like they have worked out in great detail in in the east and i was sort of hoping that maybe we could i don't know if our bindo covers any of that um but he comes out of that Hindu tradition, not necessarily Buddhist, uh, but Nagarjuna was a Buddhist, I believe, but he was Thanks. living in India. So I think there's these, uh, I, I'm just open-minded because I think that our, our, our the Western civilization, according to uh, a, a, an author I'm reading now because of Gidley's paper, Aaron Gar, I think his name is, he says it's uh, Western civilization is nihilism incorporated. <laughs> <laughs> he does not have high hopes. <laughs> I hope he's doing more than just deconstructing. Actually, I would. <laughs> I think he is trying to reconstruct. He says basically yeah. the humanities have um, have uh, shot themselves in the foot and tried to run a relay race. You know, um, he so he thinks that the the humanities uh, are to blame for their own demise, um, and he's hmm. he is a. He's coming out of that academic world, but I think he's doing more than, I think he's critical of the postmodern, and I think um, Benedictory is as well. Um, I have to get to Benedictory. Yeah. yeah, it's a great one. Uh, it's a, another great essay. So I'm just trying to make sense of this uh, uh, along with you guys and trying to, I think we, those of us who are drawn to this meta theory, and um, I think this is high intellectual play. I think it, because um, I, I enjoy it enormously even though i hate it <laughs> <laughs> don't know what you know, sense i can make of it but there's yeah, something to it you know <laughs> yeah it, it's a love hate because i you know don't you have something better to do you know <laughs> I, had a, I had an old boyfriend he was a dancer he was a very much a, he was a very, he was a modern dancer he was a very beautiful dancer and he was he he, he would yell at me all you do is sit and read all day. <laughs> Go out and live. <laughs> I said, but this is, this is living to me. You know, books are my best, they're my little friends, you know. I, I gotta say, I gotta say, I, when, once I realized that my, my wife's instincts, not that she's in the magical structure, but her, her instincts are there, instant connections, you know, not this kind of sequential bulk and logic that I've got to wrap around. But, and once I stopped having those kinds of power structure, struggle arguments with her, <laughs> her relationship but, has been, I have to thank Gebser. <laughs> right, right. Well, I, I think we're often drawn to or attracted to people who compliment us or who have skills or abilities that we don't have that we, you know, right. stimulate. Because I've had I a lot of them. 
I've been drawn to dancers. Even though I don't dance, don't ask me. <laughs> I'm definitely like to sit and watch. You know, I'm definitely the observer when it comes to dancing. I have a dance trauma. So here I am, like drawn to dancers. So my best friends are dancers. It's weird. So, but I not, but you know, readers, I like, uh, I, I do like to be around readers and writers. Um, but I think it's, a, it's, a, it's an odd group, you know. I think our writers group, Doug, it's a uh, really very interesting. And actually, I feel like my um, my desired outcome. I feel like I've gotten it, which was to create a, a community of people who were into transformation. You know, to, to co-create a community who's interested in transformation. And I always was looking for that Goldilocks zone, you know, where it's if it, it's not too difficult, but it's not too easy. And I was always getting involved in groups that, it, oh, I'm, this is too easy for me, or it's like way too hard. So I feel like I found that, that zone that I think is um, just right. And um, that's pretty rare. I mean, I'm, I'm really pleased that I believe this is coming together thanks to, to Marco's uh, vision and mm -hmm. his, um, mm -hmm. his sharing his skills and each of us have our own skill set and I, um, we all have uh, similar and but different interests. And I think that, that we can complement one another, uh, one another's efforts. Um, I think we have a real I chance. I can't read everything. <laughs> <laughs> my book at my, my apartment is full of books I haven't read. And now I'm going out, I have to resist going out and buying some more. <laughs> so I, think there's, I think there is a kind of insanity in this, this uh, uh, I think it's a healthy insanity. You That's can have worse drugs of choice, trust me. Absolutely, <laughs> absolutely. But that it's a drug, it's it has drug-like yeah. effects for sure. It creates all kinds of in uh, endorphins, I'm sure, when you're reading at your best. But it also gives us a chance at that transdisciplinary approach. Right. You know, if we can scatter and collect and then come back and, you know, connect. Absolutely. That's the biggest part too, is um, it's not, we're not pigeonholed in any certain sense. I, I can right. bring up Sam Harris. Uh, it's not like yeah. the integral crowd where even though it is integral, it, it tends to focus on just some sort of Meta model or AQAL. <laughs> yeah, or yeah, it's overproduced in a certain sense. Mm. The, the maps have too many key <laughs> items you have to focus on there and um, so yeah, our, our ragtag group here really. I get nervous when there's not enough chaos. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I, I stir up trouble as much as I can. <laughs> I get really grumpy sometimes. <laughs> You've been doing good at a kind of voicing what you feel, which has been actually pretty productive. So we don't spend five or 10 minutes just saying, oh, what, do, what do you want to do? Yeah, well, I, I feel- know. What I, do you want to do? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah well, I, I feel the pressure. I feel, you know, I think there's some, um, we're up against it and um, I want to make the best of it. You know, uh, we got everything to win, you know? So I think this is inspirational and I'm really very appreciative that you guys took time to hang out together and um, do a little spin off. Cause I know that um, you haven't been able to join us on the cafes TJ, although you've yeah. been an influence, you've influenced quite a bit. That's what's going on and your comments are very appreciated. You, you have a kind of meta perspective um, that you offer because um, and I think that's helpful yeah. to have someone who wasn't there but they can make uh, comments about it make summaries that's very helpful for those of us who are in there and you know like for me it's like performance mode and I I, I like to review it I find myself uh, that self-reflexive capacity mm -hmm. starts to kick in when I when I view the video afterwards and uh, I think that's that slow mind and that fast mind. You know, that fast mind is very intuitive and just going with the flow. And, um, but then that self-reflexive part of us can kick in and feed that back. <clears throat> I believe we can really use this technology with, um, you know, we can finesse it and I think make some useful contributions, you know, so that we could yeah. move towards that app perspective or whatever right. that, whatever that, that looks formal. Like. <laughs> mm -hmm. but, or that post, re-educate ourselves. I think this is the, the key here is it's not, no one's going to do this 
no one's going to do it for us. Right. And so to have to re-educate ourselves and um, it's, 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 it's keeping important. ideas floating. It's keeping ideas in there and and floating. And and like I said, I think I forget what the thread that was, but you know, just anything to make that kind of positive push. Maybe it's a pipe dream, but you lose nothing by by arguing That's for it. Right. That's know? right. That's right. And I think these modeling exercises definitely enlarge my capacity to hold different perspectives and. I really appreciate you guys uh, sharing with me uh, because I think it creates a, a sort of intimate zone that you know each other at a much deeper level when you mm -hmm. know their map. You know, you, when you've right. shown that map, it's a, it brings together the cognitive and the visual and the auditory and the language and the nonverbals. So I feel that's uh, where we can feel those rhythms, you know, that are unique to each of us. Um, and I'm, I'm hoping that uh, I can continue to bring these kinds of uh, map making exercises to the group, maybe it's like helping. small and formal like this. So um, I feel like uh, that, that enlarges my map making a great deal. So, so what, what our subgroup is what, Eastern time zone? I'm what magicians. Are I, made that. <laughs> <laughs> I made that up, we can change it, uh, whatever you want. Yeah, yeah, that's our subgroup in our time zone though. <laughs> So, John, as, as someone who has read everything, how, what is reading I really at your best? Not. I've skimmed it. <laughs> skimmed it. <laughs> what, does, what does reading at your best look like for you? That's a really good question. Um, to me, it's really, um, it's like, it's, it is sort of like, it is electric. And it's sort of like an out-of-body experience for me. Um, I feel like I'm, I, when I'm reading at my best, I'm going into another world. And um, it, it's, a, um, it's very immersive. And I find myself, I, I, I get so caught up in a character or the philosopher's voice or the poet or the language game, whatever they're using. It uh, just absorbs me so much that I forget about myself. And, you know, even, even when I'm walking down the street after I've stopped reading, between reading sessions, um, something will come to me, a, a phrase or a turn of phrase or just a clever argument that someone used. And I was like, wow, why didn't I think of that? You know, that was really mm -hmm. smart. And I feel that um, when I come across that, um, it, it gives me, you know, tremendous pleasure. So it's very aesthetic. It's, a, it's really aesthetic pleasure. Or, or I, I wouldn't do it. Uh, and on, on very, very rare occasions, I'll get that moment where I'm just like, oh, you know, tears will come to my eyes. I'll feel a, my heart, you know, get really warm, the warm, fuzzy feeling. That doesn't happen too often. But it did a lot when I was younger. I think as I get older, I get a little more sober and a little, uh, it gets, a, it's harder to impress me, you know, but when, when I was young, it was like, I was just overwhelmed by everything. <clears throat> it's probably universal. Yeah. 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 And I was reading great literature, you know, and just being amazed by it. So I guess my, as a reader, I feel, but thank you for that question. Cause I think it is a, it's a current. It's an, it's an electrical current. I can feel it moving through my body. It has emotional and affective qualities and, and very cognitive as well. Um, and that it connects me to a, a vast field. Uh, mm. And, I, and, I, and I, I, I'm not lonely. Mm. Sometimes I'm, a, I'm in a group of people, a crowd of people, and I found myself, you know, not finding anyone I connect with. And I wonder, why didn't I just stay home with a good book? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's a delight when I meet somebody who loves to read. Then I say, oh, well, what, what you're reading. Um, so that's a good opener for me. Um, but I'm finding that harder and harder. You know, I'll go into someone's house and I'm like, they have a huge entertainment center, you know, mm -hmm. all kinds of gadgets flashing. But it's like, where are your books? <laughs> you know, people don't have any. It scares me. You know. And that's that would be weird for me too. I grew up I not an exception in my family. I kind of inherited the everybody's got a stereo, but everybody's got a bookshelf. Both sides, moms oh, and dad sides of the family. Yeah, it's just that's where we 
That's just normal. It's just normal. You know, I've, I've had carried a book around with me since I was about seven, just, you know. That's like great. Linus had a security blanket. I was always reading something. So both, the, both of your parents were readers. But yeah, yeah, that's where I get it from. That's great. I mean, they did read to me when I was a kid, but they basically, mm. you're on your own. Yeah. <laughs> they, didn't, they didn't stop me from reading. Right, right. And it's a good thing they didn't know what I was reading. <laughs> so <laughs> it was pretty wild, you know, <laughs> way over my head. <laughs> and pretty risque stuff I was reading. But they left right. me alone. So I, I guess think that's what, what you said about yourself when, when asked the question about reading at your best kind of really shows that you embody your reading. Mm. TJ and I were, were saying we were kind of accessing the switchboard. Right. You're saying you're the actual current. So you are within the reading. You are. Yeah. You and are that space we're hoping to get to. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Oh, oh, I don't know about that. I mean, I, I think you guys are excellent readers and you're very good writers. I think you communicate very well. So I think there's a camaraderie. Or at least that the, the energy that we hope to kind of. Oh yeah. I, through. yeah, yeah. Yeah, I think we. I, I know I do. Uh, I feel like you. You're lifting me up so that I, I have, because I know there's an intelligent audience paying attention to what I'm saying. I rise hopefully to the occasion more often than not. But I think without Much that, more often than not, <laughs> without that collaborative flow, right? I would right. be, you know, just hanging out and reading on my own and enjoying it. But I don't think I would have the direction that I think this group provides. Cause I, cause if I have a, an assignment and I have a deadline, I will do it. I definitely appreciate that about this group. Yeah. Yeah. It's sort of yeah. like, it's, it's like graduate school without the, <laughs> not having to take a test. <laughs> <laughs> so I think Doug said it best. It's like, I feel like I'm taking a bunch of college courses and I'm drowning. <laughs> yeah. But it's a good, you know, but it's good. But I, I can good. drop out at any time. <laughs> plus side and I didn't blow $100,000. So. Yeah, right. yeah. And you don't have to turn it into something marketable. Right. You know, right. I think uh, so many of us are inhibited by going, getting a degree. It's like, well, what do, what good is a degree in basket weaving going to do me, you know? <laughs> so I, I anyway, I, I guess I've taken up enough of your time. Um, if there's done. anything y'all want to say to close. I, uh, I just wanted to mention the kind of self-reflexive mode we're in right now. I, I noticed in our cafes, we're tending towards saying, well, either drawing on past cafes or actually refer referencing the actual cafe and saying, this is uh, a I great space great. for um, gaining this and this knowledge. Uh, I, I think it might be useful to, to kind of identify not necessarily pigeonhole ourselves, but at one point we did say, um, or maybe it was Jeffrey mentioned this person is like this person in this book or something like that. But uh, Gidley mentions the, the the map, the territory, and the guide for yeah, yeah. Uh, Wilbur Steiner and I thought that was Gibson. Yeah, and yeah. that that was a great way to phrase it. And when we identify those characteristics within ourselves without doing the pigeonholing. Um, it can be very useful. I think. Yeah, and I think what you were doing, um, I, I think you made a comment today, Doug, and I applaud you for it because I could tell there was a, a self-reflexive capacity that you're bringing to the group. And uh, I hope more of us will continue to do that just as, as TJ was doing with these, uh, showing us these different maps uh, <laughs> and how he's working out his process. And I hope you'll post that. That last one you were showing with the circle and the... Yeah, I'll try to scan that in too. Could you, could you post those? Yeah, I would really good. like to, I would really appreciate it. Because I think it's, um, it, it, it's rhythmic, you know, it, it has a pulse. It has Trying an to do something. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's right. That's right, it was, it's a communication. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think that's great when we can take those internal processes that we're engaged in, which is so unconscious when we're reading well and externalize it. And then I think you can re-internalize re it and it goes deeper into your neurology. That would be my expectation. Um, and that's why I think that the value of this kind of playing around, because this is play, you know, drawing pictures and <laughs> playing these language games and sort of teasing apart stuff with this clean language. Um, and yet that's the building blocks of culture. 
I think Art, so. Language, how we express ourselves in space time. I mean, that's the, that, you know, that's the thing that fascinates me about social and cultural history, but it, it, it really does boil back down to these very simple expressions and gestures and absolutely you know, it's, it's and, totally fascinating and i think it's that as if if we just act as if we are integral we may shock ourselves right <laughs> <laughs> they wake up one day and say why was this a problem <laughs> it's almost like we need to do that because if you try to plan it we're going to screw it up and go straight to deficient mode right exactly, exactly. <laughs> Exactly. And I think I, there's something I, our friend um, Marco said, if we just, maybe an integral person doesn't need that word, integral. Right, right. You know? <laughs> and, I, and, and I think that's an interesting kind of thing, because it's sort of a placeholder, apperspectival, integral, post-formal. Um, I think we can describe these attributes and qualities of this new capacity that's starting to emerge. Um, and I and for me, it's sort of like an as if frame. I'm just sort of um, taking each author and just trying it on, mm -hmm. you know, like a costume. And then I'll take it off and put on another costume, and act that one out. So I think this is very creative. I'm so grateful that you guys hung out and shared your your reading selves, best reading selves with us. And I'm looking forward to the video. Gonna be good. One last question, John. Sure. Desert Island, Shakespeare or Euripides, and you have to pick one. Oh man. <laughs> you know, I I never I never was in a Euripides play, but I think Medea is one of the most powerful plays I've ever seen. I saw it when I was very young. Mm -hmm. I saw a very old English actress playing it, Dame Judith Anderson. That's and not was, the video you shared. No, that so was yeah, another was actress. Different. Very accomplished, yeah. Zoe, Zoe Caldwell. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but the nurse in that is Judith Anderson. She was once a leading lady who played like Medea and I saw her when I was a kid. But I think that was one of the pivotal moments when I was a kid, because I went, wow, mm -hmm. this, she was so powerful. I said, I want to do that. I want to get <laughs> on stage and be, be that way. Yeah. And, um, but I did Shakespeare, a lot of Shakespeare, and it's just, it's, it becomes a part of you. You know, I'm so grateful. It's such a training because I immerse myself mm -hmm. for, for, for years in that. And uh, it supports me. But I also think it programs you. It programs you to, to deal with life in a certain way. Okay. So when the, the grief and the, the sorrows and the, the slings and arrows, slings about and arrows outrageous of outrageous fortune. fortune. <laughs> you go, oh, yeah, that's what Hamlet was talking about. <laughs> so that is a hard one. What about you? Who are you going to take to that desert island? Yeah, I would have to take Shakespeare only. Really? Because there's so much. Yeah, I mean, King Lear and Hamlet. Are, I truly would miss Medea, though. <laughs> yeah. Truly. And would. the Trojan women. And the Trojan women, yeah. And and Sophocles too, uh, the Greeks are. Listen. yeah. <laughs> the Greeks are awesome. So thank you, gentlemen. Thank Is there you, any closing John. statement, Doug? Did you want to say? No, you okay? I, <laughs> I'd have to take uh, an extra person to interpret Shakespeare if oh. I was on the island. So, um, no, I haven't read much. I, I need to dive into that. That one surprises day. me. He seems very. Very versatile. Uh, there wasn't said much you came to of that going on when I was younger, so, um, and I'm still young, so there's yeah. always time. <laughs> I, I just had a question as to which we can discuss in the forum more, but do we want to continue this weekly, bi-weekly, monthly, or just see what happens? I know, I know I personally will become somewhat busy, but I'll actually be off of work. Um, you mean for this, uh, the standard time, Eastern standard time magicians here? Mm -hmm. Sure. Let's make the magic happen. I have the time. I know you You guys are working. So I have a lot of leisure time right now, but let me know. I do know my schedule gets crazier and then settles down and gets crazier. So I, I don't know if I can commit to weekly, but this is a very good time to meet. So if we know it's coming up and I got a, you know, a couple of weeks notice that, you know, I can commit to, to that well, much of it. Yeah, I can, I can do that on a monthly basis. 
along with the whatever other other readings we're doing if yeah, it's comfortable mm -hmm. we can we, we kind of make it in, we can make it informal um but we could um because i know you, you you can't come to the cafes too often mm -hmm. and, and it can um, be more spontaneous too even not mm -hmm. necessarily let's do it monthly just Okay, we've been reading. And something five or comes six. up or something really strikes yeah. us. Yeah, oh, absolutely. Yeah. Well, you have an epiphany and you just have to share it. <laughs> <laughs> I think this would be a good opportunity, you know, to cultivate reading at our best, writing at our best, intuiting at our best, modeling ourselves. Mm -hmm. I think this, uh, and for me, it's modeling. Just keep modeling. Yeah. Well, thank you, John. Was... Thank you, John. Yeah. Thank you, Great. guys. <laughs> so we'll see you guys tomorrow, right? <laughs> yes. So uh, right, guys. Off to the library tomorrow with Schlotterdijk. <laughs> <laughs> Looking forward to it. Yeah, we'll make the best of it. Okay. And Doug, <laughs> you're gonna try to you're gonna try to upload this, or you're gonna ask Marco how to do that. Uh, he'll have to do the uploading, but I, I can maybe, if you are all right, I can the thread email thread we have, I can transpose to it page and then put okay, the video great. there for all to see if, so if you are okay with that you, that would be great yeah sounds good uh, and Perfect. if you guys could post your drawings that would be fabulous yeah that'll work on <laughs> looking forward right, to guys. seeing it perfect well, great have a good night. you guys have a good night good night <laughs>